I had the, uh, the very distinct privilege of growing up under the watchful eye of my grandmother, Georgia Moore. Uh, my grandparents lived in the same small rural town in Ohio um, that my family did. And so as I grew up, um, I had the opportunity to have their input and their investment in my life well into adulthood. My, my grandma passed away just four years ago. Uh, my grandpa still lives in that same small town in the house where he and my grandma raised their family. He still has everyone over on Christmas and, and New Year's Eve and, and uh, does pretty well for himself for 89 years old. I still value his, his input and his influence in my life. Uh, my grandma's maiden name was Fraley. Uh, she was one of 13 kids. Um, so you can imagine our family reunions were pretty significant, something of an event. Um, and although my grandma weighed about 85 pounds, uh, my grandma was one of the most determined, probably some would say stubborn, people that I have ever met. Um, and this is something of a trait that is, is common among those who have fraily blood running through their veins. Um, if you want to experience firsthand what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, join me for a fraily family reunion. Um, I suppose when you're probably one of 13 kids, uh, if you lack determination, you probably didn't eat. Um, so it was, it was bred into who they were. And at times, at times growing up, this drove me insane about my grandma. Um, because if you found yourself in the unfortunate position of having an opinion contrary to hers, there was absolutely no way that you were going to win that battle. However, as an adult now, looking back, one of the things that I admire about her, among many, was exactly this, this unrelenting spirit. Her, her unbridled determination and, yes, even her stubbornness in many ways. Because as I look back over these qualities, it's, it's these qualities that forged and protected our family. It was her commitment to, to create a place for us to be together, to create memories, to, to laugh together and to cry together that, that forged or shaped all of us and, and we who had the privilege of sort of growing up under her care and supervision. You just don't stand in the way of a fraily. It's an unwinnable battle. My, my own dose of sort of fraily blood seems to be somewhat small and rather manageable, although I can kind of call on it when I need to. However, one of my three daughters has gotten a rather large dose of fraily blood um, and, and seems to be following in her great-grandmother's footsteps. As we enter now into the book of Acts, as we continue this, stutter, this study, we, we're looking at a portion of the story that is, that is marked by and ultimately accomplished by an uncompromising determination. As a matter of fact, I think we could call it sort of gospel stubbornness. In Acts 19 and 20, we see Paul's ministry in Ephesus. He's been serving there in this community now for three years. And although there have been difficult times, there's been hardships, this has been a season of ministry that has been incredibly fruitful. The gospel has is, is been taking root. Lives are being changed, and the very culture of Ephesus has been impacted by the truth of who Jesus is and his resurrection. But now, when everything seems to be going so well... Paul delivers this, this tearful goodbye to the church in Ephesus because Paul is determined to take the gospel to Jerusalem and ultimately on to Rome at, at seemingly whatever cost. For our purposes here today, I want us to consider the why and the how behind Paul's determination. Why and how does he 
they have this unrelenting spirit to take the gospel to Jerusalem and then on to Rome. Because if I'm being honest with you, this is not my natural inclination. My natural inclination is not to uproot myself from successful ministry or, or a caring community or, or seeing the gospel advance in order to run towards hostility and opposition. That's not what in and of myself, and I'm assuming most of you are like me, that we have a tendency, a tendency to run into. But this reaching adventure, as we've been calling it here in the book of Acts, it continues to unfold. And this is exactly what Paul is going to do. We're going to look together at Acts chapter 21 and, and 22. There's going to be select portions of these two chapters as we explore Paul's determination to preach the gospel in Jerusalem and Rome. So let's pick things up together in the beginning of Acts chapter 21. We're going to read the first 15 verses. It says, after we had torn ourselves away from them, so this is following this tearful goodbye that he delivers to the community, the church in Ephesus, after they had torn themselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kaz. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patera, and we found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia. We, we went on board and set sail, and after sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed to Syria. We landed in Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding the disciples there, we stayed there set with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and the children accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and we returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed in Ptolemais, where we, we, we greeted the brothers, and we stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea, and we stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt. He tied his own hands and feet with it, and he said, The Holy Spirit says... In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm not, I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. There's a, couple, there's a couple things that stand out to me as we're working our way through this, as it relates to this, this gospel determination that Paul has. And it begins with the awareness of his calling, his gospel calling. Paul is now making the journey from Ephesus to Jerusalem, and along the way, he will receive these warnings about what will happen to him as a result of his ministry to the Jews in Jerusalem. In verse 4, it said, speaking of these disciples, they, through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And if that wasn't enough, in verse 10, Agabus, the prophet, provides an object lesson by taking Paul's belt and tying himself up with it and says, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Despite very clear and specific directed words, Holy Spirit directed words, Paul remains undeterred. So how do we understand this? Is Paul here just being obstinate? Is, is he disregarding the warnings of the Holy Spirit? I don't, think, I don't think that's what's happening in this passage. First of all, when you look over in chapter 20, verse 22, we can see that the Holy Spirit is the one who has compelled Paul to go to Jerusalem. It says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. 
Paul's determination to preach the gospel in Jerusalem isn't disobedience to the Holy Spirit. Paul has already additionally, he's already been warned by the Holy Spirit regarding what will happen to him in Jerusalem. It goes on in verse 23. It says, I, know, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. You see, the information that the Holy Spirit has provided in all of these occasions is, is the same. It's the application of that information that is different. Paul's friends, they're hearing these, these warnings, and their conclusion that they draw is don't go. Don't go there. But Paul here is being driven by something greater. His determination to get to Jerusalem is the outworking of his calling. We think about, as we've been working our way through Acts, we remember that following Paul's conversion experience on the road to Damascus, God sends Ananias to tend to Paul to restore him, but also to deliver a very specific message. Flip back with me to Acts chapter 9. This is Acts 9, verses 15 and 16. Ananias, but the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. This, this is Paul's calling. To carry the name of Jesus before Gentiles, before their kings, and before the children of Israel. Paul goes because his job wasn't done yet. His determination is the outworking, it's the result of his calling. Many years ago, when I was a young youth pastor, I sort of doing ministry in my own strength, which is never a good thing. And I just got to the end of my rope. I remember being in this sort of dark season of the soul, and, and, and really, I, if I'm being completely honest, I was absolutely ready to give up. I remember sitting in my living room with my wife in this sort of sprawled out, exhausted posture, and, 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 and sharing with her that I was done. I just, I could not continue to go on, and I was brainstorming what I might do next in order to provide for my family and, and, and make a living. I remember as we were in the midst of this conversation, Sherry broke in, and he said, what else can you do? Which wasn't the first thing I wanted to hear in that moment because at the time what I thought she was saying is you have a limited skill set. Uh, but that's not what she was doing at all. She was redirecting me back to my calling. She was directing me back to our calling. The calling that we had felt together as a couple. The calling that we felt that God had laid in front of us for our family. Her sense is that God had not removed that calling, and if he had not removed that calling, then we did not have permission to do something else. I remember that moment. I remember that question, and I often think that had it not been for that redirection, I'm not sure what I would be doing today. And I want to be clear here, because we may never sort of receive the specific call in the exact same way that Paul did. Or, or, or we aren't all called into full-time vocational ministry. But make no mistake, you are called. If you are here this evening and you are a follower of Jesus, then you are called. You are called to take the gospel out. That mission is clear and specific. We are called as the church to build his kingdom. You and I are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus to a world that is broken and hurting. We're called to be his ambassadors. When we as the church, when we lose sight of our calling, we will inevitably, 
lose our gospel determination. In addition then to Paul's awareness of his gospel calling and how that is propelling him to Jerusalem, his determination also seems to be the outworking or the result of his gospel compassion, of his gospel compassion upon Paul's arrival in Jerusalem, we're told that Paul and Luke and those traveling with them are received warmly. They hear about the ministry that took place and all that God was doing among the Gentiles, and it said that they praised God. Let's go back now to Acts chapter 21. We're going to pick things up in verse 20. And it says, when they heard this, they praised God. And then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law, and they've been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men and join them in their purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everybody will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality." The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. And then he went to the temple to give them notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Let's pause there. Essentially, as I'm reading this, it sounds like to me that they say, look, Paul, that's great. It sounds like some great things have happened. It sounds like some incredible ministry is happening and that God is using it, but they're There's some people here that are still pretty excited about the law. And they're not huge fans of yours. Their recommendation is for Paul to engage in this ritual purification ceremony in order to validate to other Jewish Christians that he still values the law. Essentially, this is their way of Enabling Paul to say, look, guys, I'm still one of you. And Paul agrees to do it. There's a part of me that is, that's bothered by this. I want Paul to deliver some sort of articulate, articulate sermon on why that would be necessary. I want him to preach a, a, a message about the freedom that we have in Christ apart from the law. I want him to claim his rights, and I want him to stick to his gun, but that isn't Paul's response. Instead, he he willingly engages in this ritual cleansing ceremony, and he pays for the four others who have taken this vow to do the same. Paul's response is instead of claiming his rights, Paul lays them down in an effort to remove any obstacles that might otherwise obscure the message of the gospel that is going to the Jews in Jerusalem. And this this isn't compromise as it relates to the gospel. In verse 25, they affirm that they're in agreement with the decision that the Jewish council had made in Acts 15. Rather, this is a reflection of Paul's willingness to do whatever it takes to preach the gospel to his own people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, Paul would instruct the church as it relates to gospel compassion about what that looks like. And he says to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. I wonder if... When Paul was writing these words, when he was writing these instructions, if he did not have this very moment in mind. You see, gospel compassion so breaks our hearts for the loss. For those who have yet to discover the freedom and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. That it forces us to ask the question, what do I need to do to make the gospel real to them? 
What right do I need to be willing to lay down in order for them to see Jesus in me? Paul's heart was so moved with compassion that he would literally lay down every right for the opportunity to share the gospel in Jerusalem. Just as he had understood that Jesus had done for him in order to redeem him. This gospel compassion culminates in the end of this chapter. Later on in Acts 21, in in verses 27 through 36, Paul is eventually spotted in the temple as a part of this ritual cleansing. He is falsely accused of desecrating the temple by allowing a Gentile to enter the temple courts. He is seized and he's dragged from the temple and rioters literally begin to beat him to death. A Roman commander hears all that's going on and he breaks into the mob. He essentially saves Paul's life. But he also puts him in chains and places him under arrest. This is Paul's response now, picking it up in verse 37. And it says, as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek, he replied? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? So the Roman commander here, there's a case of mistaken identity. He thinks that he has this criminal that the Roman Empire has desired to arrest for some time, and now he understands that that's not who he has. He says, Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Let me speak to the people. And having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and he motioned to the crowd. And when they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. Gospel compassion. Look, Paul's response to an angry mob that drug him out of the temple nearly beat him to death and fully intended to do so, once he is rescued, is to go to the Roman commander and say, listen, can I have one more opportunity to speak to these people? Can I have one more opportunity to share with them everything that they are missing? I don't know about you, but when somebody nearly beats me to death, my natural response is not to find a way to offer them hope and new life. But Paul's is that is gospel compassion. He is so moved because this is, in fact, his calling. His heart is so broken for them that despite what has just happened to him, he stops everything in order to share with them the message of Jesus Christ. And this is where we see unfold this third aspect of his determination, and that is gospel courage. Gospel courage. Paul's response here is both simple and it is profound. His defense is his story. And in his story, we discover the source of his courage. We're picking it up now in Acts 22. It says, when they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Paul is actually a very strategic uh, proponent, speaker of the gospel. Him using Greek with the Roman commander validated his background in education. It's the reason why he knew that this was an educated man and not this terrorist. That he was. In. And now he's speaking to the people in, in Aramaic the common language, in order for them to know, to relate to them on where they're at. It says when they hear him speak in Aramaic, they get quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of of Sicilia, brought up from this city. Under Gamal, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way to the death arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison, as also the high priest and council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to the brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. So Paul begins by saying, this is who I was. 
Know my history and background. Verse 6 now. He says, about noon, as I came near to Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. As we have already talked about in this study of the book of Acts this year, this is the pinnacle moment in Paul's life. This is the moment that everything changes, and this is the very source of Paul's courage. For Paul, the reality that this Jesus of Nazareth, who he knew was crucified, who he knew was um, dead and buried, who he was actively seeking to stomp out this radical group of followers that was running around claiming that he was alive, When he found out that this Jesus of Nazareth, that he raised from the dead, it was in that moment that he discovers that it was all true, that Jesus is alive. This was the moment for Paul that everything changes. This is the moment on that place on the road to Damascus where Paul meets Jesus and where his courage comes from. You see, courage is not the absence of fear. I would guess that Paul in that moment was very much afraid. That would be a natural human emotion. But courage overcomes fear. And in this case, Paul's courage, gospel courage, is the result of one fundamental, life-altering truth. Jesus is alive. Paul tells his story. And in his story, we see the very moment that Paul is drawing on right now to put everything out there, to risk everything for the sake of the gospel. And he does so because Jesus is alive. Paul is courageous because Paul has experienced Jesus. And we see this in his story. Let me just say a couple things here about what we talk about as faith stories. Because in, in some ways, every story is, is different. Every story starts in a different place. Every life is like a fingerprint. It's completely unique in some way. But then on the flip side of that, every story is the same because at some point in time, or, uh, and then our story, sooner or later, in our faith story, there's this encounter with Jesus. Paul's was on the road to Damascus. Mine was in a small bedroom on Maple Street in Eaton, Ohio, as I heard my dad explain to me the gospel, and I knelt beside my bed with him and prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior. Yours may be completely different. But we all need to know our story. We need to remember our encounter with Jesus. Where the awareness that Jesus is alive so penetrated our hearts that we moved from spiritual death to spiritual life. Because therein we get the courage that is going to be required of us to live out our calling. Let me encourage you, if you you read the remaining portion of Acts chapter 22. You see the rest of Paul's story, how he was not only saved from something, but he was saved to something. It returns to his calling. The whole story, Paul's faith story, is about 450 words, about two typed pages. How would you write down your own story? How would you describe your encounter with Jesus? Paul here provides an excellent model for us, an outline of sorts, as we read the rest of this chapter. It begins with his past. Who was I? What what did I believe? How did I live before meeting Jesus? And then it gets to the point of, of how he met Jesus. How did you and I meet Jesus? How did we become to understand who he is and what he did for us? And then thirdly, what's the difference? What's the difference in our life from that moment forward? 
I believe that God has amazing things in store for this church. Amazing things in store for you as we continue to see his work being played out around us. But I believe they are the sort of things that will, that will take a resolute determination. The sort of determination that can only come from a belief and awareness of our calling. The sort of determination that stems from a heart of compassion for the lost. And the sort of determination that results from knowing and believing that Jesus is alive. It's gospel determination. It says, this is where I'm sending you. This is how Paul was going, despite knowing exactly what lay in front of him. I pray that we would be able to do the same. Would you pray with me? And uh, why don't you stand and I will um, offer the benediction as well. Let's pray together. Father, we do just, Lord, we recognize as your church that you have called us. That you have called us to take the gospel out. That you have called us to be your representatives right now, right here in this community in a broken world. God, we pray that we would be used of you for your purposes and for your glory. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus and go now in the name of Jesus Christ who calls us to take the gospel out in his name and who gives us the courage to do it. Amen.